Let's have a prayer. Let's have a prayer. God, we give you thanks for the gift of music and for the gift of all the people gathered here. Uh, bless the words that I'm about to speak. Let your spirit be present. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so how does this start now? So the thing about debt is that it's a little like getting into a swimming pool that doesn't have any ladders. It's easy to get in, but it's a lot harder to get out. And it can start slow. It can start small. Um, I remember being a, at the University of Delaware, and um, you're in the we're in the student center, and there's like loud people talking at the little tables. You can smell the fast food that you could buy on the. You were there at the Turbine Center. You know what I'm talking about, right? And so there were, um, and there'd be a kiosk, and people would be signing folks up for credit cards right there at the kiosk, and. Um, if you sign up, you get a little prize, right? I think they do this in, like, sports stadiums, too. You get a little prize. You get a hat or a T-shirt or a Frisbee. And I'm sure that a lot of folks who signed up at first thought, oh, well, I won't use the credit card. Um, I'll just get the little prize. Uh, but then once you have the plastic in your hands, it's very easy to say, oh, well, but I really need these books for school. I'll put them on the credit card. And then you might say, well, I really... Uh, need these clothes to wear, um, and then maybe it becomes I I really need that concert ticket, and then I really need the pizza and beer on a Friday night. So um, it can be a little bit like you get into the pool and you start wading in, and you're getting accustomed to the water, and then suddenly you're up to your neck before you know it. Or sometimes we find ourselves in debt because we've bitten off a little more than we can chew, some kind of a big purchase you know when you're looking at your dream house you might think to yourself oh i can i would be happy to live at home and always eat at home right but then three years into ramen noodles every night you start to feel like you've got weights on your ankles that that debt becomes like a weight on your ankles as you're trying to tread water or it may be that there's something that puts us into debt that's beyond our control an emergency a medical um, problem, uh, uh, mental illness. Uh, it may be a disaster that we weren't able to prepare for. And so there's so many ways that um, I, I read a story a few months ago about a man who co signed on a loan for his son's education. And then his son, um, and it was over $100,000, and then his son died about three months after graduating. Um, and it was private loans. And so those folks don't forgive debts just because the person died. And so here he is. And that is like being thrown into the deep end. Yeah. And it was a music degree, too. Anyway, that's beside the point. Um, yeah, it was terrible. And in fact, he was having trouble even tracking down who he owed the money to because the loans had been sold so many times. Um, so yeah, getting thrown into the deep end. So if we think of debt as being like a swimming pool... The guy who we read about today in our story from Scripture is out in the ocean two miles from shore with no boat in sight. He owes 10,000 talents to the king. Um, one talent in those days was worth about as much as you would get in 15 years of working. right? And so if you multiply it out, he owed the guy about $5 billion. Right? You know, and so there's some questions I have about this. Like, first of all, who approved that loan, right? Like, was this a no-doc loan, or did he have some collateral? I don't know. Who approved it? Um, and then second, what did he do with all that money, right? I mean, because how many togas and sandals and, like, fatted calves can you buy with $5 billion? Uh, you know, and then third, why didn't he do something with the money to prevent him from being in the situation of having to pay it back, right? Like... Invest in a business, you know, or maybe buy an island in Greece and go there with your family. You know what I mean? Like, so obviously there aren't real answers to this because Jesus' main point in the story is about forgiveness. Is to say that God forgives us the equivalent of $5 billion. And that if someone owes us a debt that in today's money would be $10,000, it is a big debt. But it's not, uh, by comparison to what we owe to God, it's nothing. But, um, so that, uh, that is the kind of the main thrust of this text. But there is a piece, I believe, that, is, that we can see in it that is about debt um, as well, since it's literally a story about debt. Um, and one part of that is, is that debt is very hard on our relationships. 
um, the man who owed all this money, um, his family was literally going to be torn apart and sold. Everything he had was going to be sold. And um, bankruptcy court is a little more forgiving these days, most of the time. But still, we know that many marriages have tremendous stress and can break apart because of stress over money. And it's one thing to disagree about how money should be spent when you have enough of it. But when you are under the weight of debt, it is a different story entirely. And similarly, when he meets his fellow slave and he grabs him by the throat and he's so violent with him, he throws him into jail, um, that debt between them becomes um, a barrier and breaks their relationship. Um, my dad's words of wisdom are to never loan anybody a personal loan. Um, if you can afford to lose the money, then give it. But if you can't, then don't. Because the loan by itself, uh, to have a loan between you, um, creates tension in the relationship so that if anything goes wrong, you lose that relationship. And it's not worth it. So if you can lose it, give the money. If you can't, don't. So um, that's my dad's words of wisdom. Can you believe it? Yeah. Go, Dad. Um, oh, shoot. So, all right. So we, we're talking about debt. We're talking about relationships. Okay. So what the version of the Lord's Prayer that we're going to be reading again this week, that we have been the last couple of weeks, uses forgive us our debts in it. And um, I always grew up saying, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive others. That's the way I grew up saying it. But looking into the scholarship, it looks like Jesus' original words may have been closer to debts. Like literally, we as a community in this new kingdom that Jesus is building don't want anybody to be drowning in debt. And so we forgive each other our debts. Um, we make gifts and not loans. And I believe that that is about God wanting us to be free in every possible way. That God desires for us um, freedom from slavery to anything, uh, including to money, to debt. Now, does that mean that um, if we pray really hard that a big check will show up or we'll win the lottery? I don't think so. But I have a story about it. I have a story about it. So there's an author... Her name's, um, she's a pastor in Illinois. Her name's Lillian Daniel. And actually, she's a still-speaking writer's group writer from this Advent devotional that I'm excited about. So that's a little commercial for the Advent devotional. But anyway, um, and she tells a story about being like four years into ministry, and she's got two kids in daycare. They're paying off big student loans. Her husband isn't getting paid at his job because of various things. And um, she's feeling the stress of it. And she's, um, she's late for picking her kids up at daycare. Um, and it's sort of like a symbol as much as just a stress. Because she knows she's going to have to pay a fee. And the reason she's late is because she tried to pack too much in. There was no margin for error in the day. And um, the same way with her budget. There's just no margin for error. And she's got her... And she's sitting in traffic, stuck in traffic in Hartford on kind of an overpass. And she, you know, last resort, starts to pray about this, right? You know, after everything else is exhausted. Starts to pray about it. And suddenly looks at the cityscape. And the city is like gleaming, is how she describes it. It looks like um, it's shining. Like a heavenly city. And then kind of the effect fades. And she closes her eyes, opens them again. And the city is gleaming again. Um, and so she's not sure what to make of this. But then, so she, she closes her eyes again the, and um, keeps praying. And she has three images come up in her mind. And one is um, a picture of a big pair of scissors cutting up her credit cards. And one is a picture of a big present, beautifully wrapped. And one is the figure 10%. So she goes home and she says, Honey, we're going to cut up the credit cards and we're going to um, start tithing to the church. And her husband says, Well, that's great, but how are we going to pay for it? She says, We have a big present coming. There's a big present. Are your relatives planning to send us a check? He says, well, I don't think so. Um, she says, I, Mine aren't either. I don't know what that is, but we'll have to wait. So they get everything set and she's waiting and she's waiting for the big present. And never comes that she never gets like a big check in the mail uh, but slowly uh, things start to even out somehow and their debts start to go down um, in ways that she isn't even clear how it happens exactly um, so I want to read you 
um, kind of a last piece on what she says about that big present that she saw. I later came to understand that the second part of my three-part vision actually had come true. The big gift had arrived after all. It was in the wise words of one Christian to another amidst spreadsheets, insurance forms, and tax returns. It was in the generosity of my parents and in-laws who had stepped in over the years to cover camp fees and instrument lessons for our children. It was in the health of our kids, the kindness of friends who covered for one another in lean times, the countless little gifts that come our way all the time. But most importantly, the gift was Christ, in whom my debt had long since been paid. So I believe that God wants freedom for us. And that if we find ways to put God at the center of our lives, then the other pieces will come into order. Um, And that over time, we may find that the waters that we were um, trying to keep, trying to tread in, trying to tread the water in, that the waters have receded and that we are standing free on dry ground. Let's pray. God, give us strength to trust you. Give us hope to follow you. Open our hearts. And help us to build the community and the kingdom that you call us to. Amen.